seminar uh, It's the first uh, lecture of the semester for the Water Resources Research Center. I'm standing for all the uh, dental engagement, I understand. Uh, and uh, so we're going to post it online for the talks that are coming up. And uh, we're going to introduce them to the Hyatt. Um, our first speaker for the semester. And some background on her. Uh, yeah, she joined uh, the geology department in our environmental and field geology division in January of 2004 uh, as an assistant professor and a new associate with the last year. Mm -hmm. Recently. Uh, prior to UH, she did uh, some time at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and before that, she did her PhD at Florida State University, uh, working in oceanography, her degrees in oceanography. Prior to that, Henrietta came from uh, Czech Republic, and uh, she did her master's, and she just told me I didn't even know this, uh, most of a PhD up to uh, half of the class. Uh, when she uh, left her, so she did a master's as part of a PhD at the uh, 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 Technical University in Europe, which, by the way, is like the MIT of Europe, people like to say. I don't know, they get the ha, guys have claimed the same thing. But certainly, it's one of the oldest uh, and most prestigious technical universities in Europe. It began in the 1700s and really blossomed in the 1800s. So it's a great pedigree that she comes from. Uh, she has expertise in environmental radio uh, chemistry, uh, aqueous geochemistry, and oceanography, obviously. And she combines these expertise and talents to look at submarine groundwater discharge uh, from watersheds, we like to say ridge to reef, you know, some uh, watersheds, and looking at submarine groundwater discharge across the land ocean interface and looking at the amount of geochemical reactions associated with those waters as they pass from land to the ocean. Uh, quantifying those fluxes. And more recently, she's also been working um, on iron fluxes uh, all around Antarctica and along the Atlantic Ocean, uh, looking at iron fertilization, uh, experimentation type studies and its influence on the carbon cycle. Now your teeth. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then also with the uh, uh, Fukushima uh, uh, situation, she's been looking at the radioisotopes associated with that and the fallout and across the Pacific. Uh, and in <coughs> so today she's going to tell us all about submarine groundwater discharge and tools of the trade, uh, partly for some 12 of my students that are sitting here uh, in the same class and uh, the tools of trade. I was just noticing this diagram here. So she's going to set up in her aspect, she's going to start back in 1944. So and so she's got a lead seepage meter here, and I think I just saw Steve Dollar somewhere. Yeah, there's Steve. So uh, some of us have used these things in the past. I can brag. I when I started working on this, I inherited Steve's uh, ethic dome. Uh, that's how we get stuff. That was in the Pleistocene, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I, I don't know what geologic times. Do. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, right, so this is a combination of a class lecture and the WRS seminar. So I won't be showing you much of new things, more likely I just focus on the techniques. And um, and so when Craig asked me what title my lecture should have, we kind of came up with this, but I said, okay, I will um, name it, but never gave him a proper title. And once I put together my talk, this is rather more fitting that I will show you a really simplistic approach to looking at somebody groundwater discharge because it's quite complex. But even within this simplistic approach, the, the, the measurement, um, the measurements and assessment can be actually quite complex. And to start out with this figure, which I think every HGD uh, talk uses one of these versions, um, this really shows us a simplified coastal aquifer, which includes the freshwater part and then also uh, seawater intrusion, so the seawater interface, where um, the freshwater is filled from recharge from land and the hydraulic gradient that's set up 
across here pushes the groundwater flow towards the ocean and it's driven by topography, recharge rates, hydraulic variants and geology and so forth. And from the ocean part, ocean side, we have various um, physical processes that drive seawater circulation. So flux into the aquifer and eventually also out on different scales, both uh, time, and temporal and spatial scales. And <clears throat> there will be several terms that I'll be using during this talk. One of them is the subterranean estuary, which is the zone where this fresh water meets the recycled seawater. We call it the recycled seawater because it starts out as seawater, becomes groundwater, and then becomes seawater again as it exits the, um, the, the aquifer. And so the place where the seawater and fresh water meet is called the subterranean estuary in analogy to surface estuaries. And um, for the, the last decades, it's been recognized that um, the early hydrological models could not really um, explain this interface real well, not until it was recognized that salt can mix into this fresh water, not just by dispersion, but other physical processes. And there is indeed salt flux across groundwater flow lines. And, and so <coughs> this was recognized, it became clear then that fresh groundwater discharge is not the only process that happens um, at these groundwater outcrop sites, but there is also brackish or even salt, salty groundwater discharging to the coastal ocean. And um, <coughs> so we have these different components, various driving forces that drive SGD, and because of its composition, that it can be any variation of fresh to completely marine solidity or even hypersaline. Um, the definition is that uh, groundwater discharge is um, discharge of any uh, subsurface fluids of any composition across the um, land ocean interface. And, and mostly for the students that are here and quite uh, new to this topic, I will explain the different scales. To what do we call, call SGD and what we don't really consider SGD? What are the scales of, let's say, the seawater recirculation? Um, what, what, where do we say, okay, this is not <coughs> considered SGD? So this um, nice sketch has actually been reproduced in the field. Uh, these are measurements of salinity in a subterranean estuary, so in this region right here, in Wackyard Bay, Massachusetts, where um, samplers have been put every half a meter in, uh, across this um, cross-section, and the salinity was measured, and actually there was a whole time series produced then over a couple of seasons um, at every low tide. And, uh, <coughs> Tide. And the salinities that are measured, as an example, are plotted up here. So fresh is this white, where salinities range from zero to one, and then the red would be um, almost marine. It's it's a bay, um, and it has a lot of SGD flowing into it, fresh SGD. So it never really goes fully marine. So only goes up to maybe 29 uh, salinity. You see that the interface between the fresh and the salty part is pretty sharp. Uh, only a meter in some places, some places too. Um, that's, that's relatively sharp. Here um, in Hawaii, this interface, for example, is much, much um, thicker. Um, we also see these features um, that, um, but <coughs> later on, it became clear that that saltier part of, uh, of the groundwater uh, here is due to uh, waves and, and tides pushing seawater into the top of the freshwater lands because otherwise physically this is not a stable configuration because uh, salty water, marine water is denser so it should be below the freshwater aquifer. But this is continuously regenerated due to tides and waves. So why do we care about um, SGD. Obviously, um, as this figure shows, there are several sources of solutes out on land. So we have septics and other, maybe one slide back, we have urban development, agricultural, um, and other sources of 
pollutants or other constituents that we care about on the solutes that can act eventually be transported uh, via submarine groundwater discharge to the ocean. And, and so there, is, um, there are certain aspects to SGD, and one is to look exactly at how this groundwater signature, chemical signature and physical signature, evolves on land before it discharges to the ocean. Because that then tells us a lot about pollution sources and, and so forth. Uh, on the ocean side, this recirculated seawater may also play a role in nutrient fluxes, in that the seawater fluxes through either benthic sediments that may be organic rich, so it brings in oxygenated water into the sediments that enhances remineralization, therefore makes more nutrients available that can then be transported back to the aquifer and eventually either take part in any biogeochemical processes within the subterranean estuary or um, then discharge back to the ocean. So we have a mobilization here of nutrients back. So then um, uh, it was decided that then both fresh and salty parts of HGD are uh, important. Um, here's an example of uh, nitrogen. And again, this is salty in the top figure. On the, in the middle, we have nitrate nitride which represents the more oxygenated, oxic uh, part of the aquifer and uh, the nitrogen pool, therefore. So we have um, nitrate and nitrite plume, which is actually um, within the freshwater part. So what we see here is the nitrate nitrite fits very nicely into this freshwater plume, so it's coming from terrestrial fresh, coming from terrestrial sources with freshwater, but because it has, um, or has some organics in, the, in its middle, in its core, uh, that organic matter is being remineralized, oxygen is used off, so what we have in the core is a reduced uh, nitrogen, so for ammonium. So these fits very nicely in here, and they all occur in this freshwater part. <coughs> and then the recirculated seawater, so the red area here, um, corresponds to, again, ammonium, higher ammonium concentration, no nitrate nitride there, because it's all reduced, because this water already filtered through some organic rich sediment, it lost its oxygen that used up in the biogeochemical processes. And so what we have here is nitrogen that's of marine origin. So it comes from either directly from the seawater or by the remineralization of the organic matter that's of marine origin. So all of this mostly is um, nitrogen from coming from the ocean or the, or the bay in this case. And so eventually, along flow lines, these get discharged in, into the bay. And uh, obviously, we care about nitrogen or other nutrients. Uh, RGD has been uh, blamed for eutrophication conditions, macro, micro algal blooms, and other, other uh, environmental problems. Um, but um, also, um, a trace metal flux is important. For example, the reducing core of that plume, the same plume, uh, would have a lot of dissolved iron and manganese in it, and then also the recirculated water mobilizes iron and, and manganese, which then play important roles, for example, in driving, uh, well, either directly iron discharges or, or the phosphorus chemistry and so forth. Yeah. So these are just a few examples. I will not go into much of chemistry or what's happening with all these nutrients when the water discharges offshore. What I will focus on today is really how can we detect and measure groundwater discharge and, and what are the different scales that the methods help us explain either just the near shore or going farther offshore and so forth. So <clears throat> I will start out with Holly Michael's work um, which really um, encompassed uh, using the leak height, seepage meters, and also hydrological modeling. Um, what she did is, again, still in here in Rockyard Bay, here's the coastline. She put down uh, measurement chambers and looked at what kind of water is being collected into them. And uh, she then identified where was the fresh water discharge, where we had the salty water discharge at these two different places because of different uh, driving mechanisms and <coughs> constructed this um, general um, uh, description also again now including this tidal and, and, and they've set up in those salty uh, um, recirculation there. Uh, there were 
several or multiple important findings in this work in that she looked at this seasonally. So indeed she found that when the, uh, in the summer when there is less recharge and more groundwater usage, this aquifer shrinks and uh, more seawater can replace therefore the, the void space here. And so we have um, recharge into, um, into the aquifer uh, from the bay, so seawater enters the, the aquifer. And again, when the, the aquifer expands, that most of that seawater then fluxes out, and that is more in quantity than, than any other process. So this little circulation, or just the, the tidal pumping, um, so the seasonal shrinkage and expansion of the aquifer really um, pumps a lot of seawater in and out from the aquifer. Uh, this was confirmed by a later work by Megan Gagna. She also put together a model um, for the same location. She was uh, already looking at more than just the, the, the aquifer behavior and then recharge rates. She also wanted to see then how the marine driving forces influence groundwater discharge rates. But the same idea here, the red line indicates that an aquifer that's um, shrink a little bit um, um, Either, so the hydraulic gradient is not that large between the land and the ocean side, either due to elevated sea level or, or a smaller aquifer, or then uh, lower sea level um, or increased um, hydro, results in increased hydraulic gradient. Um, so this is the same cross section. So the same cross section, uh, salinity. Um, across that um, same location. Uh, I talked about the multiple um, uh, sampler, um, loca sampling locations. So these um, stars indicate sampling locations across this interface. So she wanted to really look at the interface, how that behaves seasonally. And so we will look at a line here of salinities. So in here we have fresh going on to uh, uh, marine salinities. Um, as a static picture, if you look at that as a time series, how salinity changes um, at that interface, this is what we get. So salinity again increases into the reds. So we have higher salinities going much shallower in the aquifer. is coming much shallower in the aquifer as, as it shrinks and that should correspond and it does correspond to uh, the hydraulic head so the gradi um, uh, groundwater level um, in that same aquifer so uh, when the groundwater levels are lower indeed there's more salt salty water coming into the aquifer and then the blue line uh, sorry the black line indicates sea level which shifts um, due to various processes and what she did, she, she constructed a model in which she found that if she ignored um, marine driving forces, she could reproduce um, the fresh groundwater discharge and, and not as much the, so most of her groundwater discharge was fresh, she couldn't really reproduce the, the saltier parts, so the brackish, the salty parts. Not until she actually added a changing sea level um, that that model, the seawater intrusion into the aquifer, she was really able to reproduce the salinity changes and, and the expected um, tents. So this work shows that indeed it's not only terrestrial climate driving forces, but also marine forces such as uh, seasonal uh, sea level change. And therefore even long term sea level change should have effect on uh, total SGD, but also the role of recirculating seawater. So um, these are kind of um, uh, examples of how models have um, explained SGD. And now let's look at how you can directly measure it. Um, it occurs on the coastline in various different forms. It may be as obvious as these little uh, boils, as we call them, in the shoreline. Or at low tide, you might see water flowing out at the, at the, at the beach base. 
And um, if, if, if you have something like this, how would you quantify groundwater discharge? This usually happens over larger areas um, that covers um, a whole stretch of a coastline, or, or even in this case. So um, what you would even capture with your measurements is either one area, or you have a larger scope, but then you lose the resolution. Do you even want to include different scales of, of, of groundwater and uh, seawater recirculation? So, so my next slide should, should um, explain why I think that, that the measurement of FGD is in, indeed quite complex and, and difficult. Because so far we have talked about this section here uh, that's really a localized um, representation of our coastline. So we have, again, the freshwater aquifer discharge from it and the recirculated seawater. But that section of the coastline is only a small part of really what drives all the SGD. So we have um, an example from Alicia Wilson's paper. She models a large scale of uh, water fluxes through uh, groundwater fluxes. So this represents the, the continental slope, uh, the South Atlantic Bight, and this is sea level, so everything up from here is terrestrial, so here she shows the topo topography-driven groundwater flow. Uh, this little inset here represents the, the coastlines we have been looking it up to now, and here we have actually even more circulation through the slope, the continental slope, uh, which is driven by uh, various physical processes, uh, some of which are, for example, geothermal convection storms have been shown to also affect this circulation. So when we measure SGD, do we really just want to know this, or are we interested in these larger scales? So the answer to this is it depends what your question is and what the techniques are, what techniques are available to you. And so most often this is a scale that we are looking at on an embayment scale because we are interested in the surface water aquifer if we are looking at pollution, for example. And, and um, oftentimes there are confining layers that result in springs or discharge that happens farther offshore, but still within an embayment. So we care about those boxes also. And so the embayment scale is what we typically refer to as the classic examples of SGD we are interested in. Although Don Thomas's work, for example, has shown that these kind of circulation not necessarily exactly like this because this is a slope, but it is important on a larger scale, for example, on the Kona Coast or, or other parts of the Big Island that he found um, that there are deeper aquifers that are important. So. Um, Again, this would be probably the scale that most of our work um, relates to. And I also plotted uh, or put, the, put up these images that uh, represent a uh, much smaller scale water, seawater circulation through uh, permeable sediments. So when we have currents that create ripples, so this, this would be a bad with, with, with ripples, which um, in the ocean would be due to tidal action quite symmetric. Um, there will be water, uh, due to these currents, there will be water pumped through these ripples. And, and this down here is a model that Marcus Hiltel created, actually in an actual flume uh, chamber, that shows, he put color dye, and that shows really which way the, the dye, dye migrates, so how the, the current really causes the advection through these ripples. So this happens on over centimeter scales, and this is usually not included in the SG. This happens on, 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 on local scales, um, although it does help mobilize nutrients. Again, um, it's usually not captured with most of the techniques that we use for, for SG measurement. And so this would be, a, um, again, a much um, larger view of what are the possibilities, what are the kind of flows we can expect, on a, for example, on a continental slope. And so the near shore and embayment scale are the ones that, that, that uh, you might be interested in, or as I said, uh, Don Thomas is interested in a, a scenario where we have some confining layers and some fresh water aquifers much deeper um, than that. So, 
how can we measure SGD? And so this uh, device that is now called the V-type CPG meter, but early on it was just a, a CPG meter that wasn't even used in the ocean. It was used in lakes. So Lee <coughs> was a Canadian scientist who um, was interested in seepage into lakes. And this device was actually first used in, in the 1940s um, to uh, measure irrigation channel leakage, so water loss from irrigation channels. Uh, this is constructed from a 55 gallon oil drum where the top 30 centimeter or so is cut off. You have a little opening where, where, where you have a lid, so right there you can put in a spigot um, that has a valve to which you can attach a bag. And then you push this into the sediment and wait till the bag either fills up or, or empties some of the its content. content. So, there are several things that are important in this. I'm going to mention them because I, um, I think it's quite relevant to, to many of the things um, about SGD. So we want to leave this space as uh, small as possible so that the SGD replaces the, the content readily. Um, uh, some people had a technique that they would put in the chambers and leave them in for a longer time, at least 24 hours so after the break. After the break. And, and only then they would put the bag on. The bag would be pre-filled with about, well, we had a protocol of half a liter of water, but uh, others might have different ones. So, um, and then um, if there is SGD, then the bag would fill up slowly. Um, and there was only a limit of so, so much filling, so we'd have to go and check the bag um, once in a while that it's not overfilling yet, because then the flow would stop or, or slow down. Or then if there is recharge, into the aquifer, then you do some of that water. So it's, it's then uh, the amount of water that either fills or is lost from the bag is then normalized to the area of the drum. So our volume can be calculated how much was gained or lost uh, over, over time. Um, there are advantages and problems with this. The advantages are that you would already capture the groundwater that's coming out of the ground, so you could actually measure what's in it. The problem is that this chamber makes the sediments anoxic. So any redox sensitive elements or nutrients would be altered depending on the headspace and, and the biogeochemistry happening in this chamber would alter that. So Lee used this device to actually look at a problem that we are very familiar with and it's, it's very up to date for us also. A septic tank um, location here is indicated here by this cross. He's got some monitoring wells, and this is where he set up the seepage meters. So he was looking at uh, nutrient flux from, from a septic tank into a lake that, was, uh, that had a problem with eutrophication. And so this is pretty much set up that that's, um, we are trying to do now. We have septic tanks on the coastline, along the coastline, and so we are trying to find SGD also and the nutrient signatures. This is pretty laborious method. So you have to put out many chambers. The footprint is only half a meter. So how is this half a meter representing your whole coastline? So you have to either move this one chamber over and over, or you put out quite many, and then you can go and change the back. So it's very labor intensive. So Nakoto Taniguchi was the first one who created a, an automated seepage meter. So instead of putting a baggie on it, he attached a hose and um, uh, the hose was then attached to this um, measurement device. There are different uh, technologies that were used, but pretty much this is a, a flow meter and can measure flow at very small rates, so on the centimeters, on the order of centimeters per, um, per hour, pretty much. Um, so these were the batteries that went, um, to, went with it to power the instrument, and it could produce a higher resolution um, SGD measurement. Um, very applicable for sites like this that have um, visible seepage. Oh, here it is. Let's put the drum on it and measure, measure SGD. And of course, every method has to be cross-calibrated. So here is a comparison of the manual V type. Those are the dots and. Uh, automated seepage meter measurements and obviously expected good agreement and uh, there was no reason for it not to work. 